And I think we both know what that are like. After leaving MGM uh, and the burning secret, uh, prior to this, Jimmy and I had bought Paths of Glory. I did a screenplay with Jim Thompson and Calder Willingham, and uh, nobody wanted to do it. It was turned down by every company until uh, our agent, Ronnie Lubin, interested Kirk Douglas in the project. And uh, through Kirk's interest, uh, United Artists put up the money on uh, the basis of it being done for a very low budget in Europe. War began between Germany and France on August 3rd, 1914. This is followed by about six months spent working on a script for Kirk Douglas, which he didn't like and was abandoned, and uh, some more months working on something which Gregory Peck was supposed to do for us, which was also abandoned because it wasn't liked, followed by uh, the offer from Marlon Brando to direct his Western, which resulted in six months of work. Again, uh, abandoned as far as I was concerned because I left the project two weeks before it started. One Eye Jax was and still is really unlike anything else around. Any other Western, any other movie from 61, any other movie, period. So what is it? What else could it be, though? Because it's the one film directed by Marlon Brando, the story of betrayal and vengeance. And when it came out, we were all so excited. Of course, uh, it's the first film he had directed. We expected the unexpected, and that's what we got. The picture is adapted from a novel by Charles Nieder, uh, a Mark Twain scholar, and it was based on the story of Billy the Kid. And Brando originally had Sam Peckinpah to write the adaptation, and Stanley Kubrick was to direct. But Brando wound up working with the writer Guy Trosper and ultimately directing the film himself. Of course, Stanley uh, Kubrick was the first director of one Eye Jackson. Brando was going to be in it. And uh, they, you know, uh, at first, of course, it was a great mutual admiration. I mean, Stanley Kubrick is an extraordinary director. But as the production went on, or the preparation for it, there were disagreements, and they were stopping and going. And, you know, really, Kubrick had his own way he wanted to do it, and he being the director wanted to do it. And so finally they had a kind of summit meeting with Brando Kubrick and the producer and other people and the idea that everyone was going to kind of put forth their point of view and uh, they were going to have a compromise. So Brando shows up at the thing and he's got a gong. And he says, okay, everyone now speak for exactly two minutes and at the end of two minutes, everyone give their point of view and then at the end of two minutes, I'm gonna hit the gong and the next person. So the producer talked, you know, for two minutes and Marlon hit the gong and he stopped, the next guy did. So finally it was Kubrick's, well, Kubrick was the director and he started to explain his concept apparently and I was not there, but I heard the story and he's explaining his concept and he starts really, you know, Brando is like looking at his watch and not listening, you know, and, and of course this is frustrating to Kubrick because he was trying to really say what he was going to do and it was very annoying that Brando was just there with the gong, you know, going like that. So Kubrick's in the middle of his thing and Brando goes bong and hits the gong, you know. Kubrick kept talking and it didn't feel he had communicated and, and Brando hit the gong again and hit the gong and Kubrick got so mad he like he quit the production and so Brando directed it. And um, after a, a pre-production, uh, I think really close to the beginning of shooting, um, that's when Kubrick realized he wasn't going to stay on the picture and he left. He went to England and never came back. The actor here engaging with the dancer is Timothy Carey, one of the real legendary characters in Hollywood. Carey was a true eccentric and marched to his own drummer to such a point that he often got fired off of productions. Billy Wilder fired him off Ace in the Hole. Producer James Harris fired him off Pails of Glory after he had finished all his scenes. Carey suggested that he often wasn't hired because other actors and directors were afraid of him. He said, it's amazing how people get so afraid and weak. I was up for a big part in Bonnie and Clyde, but Arthur Penn took one look at me and almost fainted in my arms. He'd heard that I'd gotten into a punch out with Elia Kazan on East of Eden, which wasn't true, but because of the garbled story and Penn's weakness, I didn't get the part. Stanley Kubrick, though, liked Carey quite a bit and cast him as a creepy professional assassin in The Killing and as a soldier sentenced to execution in Paths of Glory. 
Carey loved to improvise, and in Paths of Glory, he goes to his execution biting the arm of an army priest. The actor playing the priest didn't like that one bit. Now we meet the other real cowboy in the cast. Slim Pickens, who plays Deputy Lon Dedrick, another character deriving from the novel. There's a lot of quiet menace in this scene, in the way that Brando and Pickens size each other up, and more great dialogue. Pickens' line, I don't have all day to stand here lipping with you, is the kind of off-the-cuff jargon that sounds authentic because of the way that he delivers it. I asked you polite. Read that sign? I got a lot of funny things to do today, but lipping with you ain't one of them. I'd say you shy a few manners, mister. Pickens was a big guy, and uh, he was very imposing on screen. He didn't often play these kinds of really depraved characters, but, uh, but he could do so quite well. Slim Pickens is awfully good throughout the film as this hawking character. Like Ben Johnson, he'd been a professional cowboy, and boots, jeans, and a cowboy hat were his everyday dress in life. He was still a bit player in movies at this time, but in a few years with Dr. Strangelove, he had his big breakthrough. He played a folksy cowboy character in Dr. Strangelove, piloting a B-52 bomber over Russia and riding an atomic bomb to obliteration like he was a wrangler on a Bronco. This clerk is played by Elisha Cook Jr., a great character actor who played Fall Guys, Punks, and Sad Sacks in numerous westerns and crime films. As soon as he appears, you just know he's going to take a bullet. His best known role is Stonewall Tory Jackson in Shane, a loudmouth blowhard who proclaims, nobody's going to buffalo me, and promptly gets blown out of his boots by the black-hatted villain and lands in a puddle of mud. So poor old Elisha Cook is probably not going to be around for long. That's it. That seemed to be his specialty in Hollywood movies of the 40s and 50s. I'll take that. 